go. All my favorite colors. Um, canvas is ready. Um, what I'm going to do, it's always really relaxing and fun to start a painting because the sloppier I am, <laughs> the more cool it looks <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> so uh, I don't worry about um, all the beginning of a painting. Um, I just pick some broad areas and lay down these big washes, kind of like I did on this. Um, I'll try to put on the screen the photograph I am using for this, but I just pick areas and I just figure out, oh, I'll, I'll give you an example on the, uh, the image I'm gonna use for this new painting. Okay, so I have this painting, um, photograph, I'm sorry, it's just a photograph, opened up in my You Doodle app which I use a lot, very simple thing to fool around with when you're trying to figure out what to do with paintings. Now, I just sort of see this sort of broad area kind of here that looks quite purple to me, actually looks down here too. So I'm probably gonna put a wash of purple there And of course, the blue, turquoise, teal, whatever that is there. Um, there's a little yellow shrub there and a kind of yellow shrub there, which I'll make a note of. And I like this red shrub here. And I love this um, sort of yellow stand of uh, shrubbery back there. And of course, the bright green there. And this whole area back here, I might just do a really dark greener, blackish green, just to start. And of course, these rocks are dark too, so I'll add some darks there. And that's a good beginning.
Good morning. I'm uh, trying to finish up this painting and I'm just going to give you a, a quick um, overview of my thinking process when trying to finish this because it's very busy, a lot of different shapes, colors, darks, lights. I'm trying to like bring it all together and these are some of the things um, I'm weighing when approaching this. Um, I've got a lot of big blocky sort of shapes and colors that are pretty rough and unfinished down here, very loose. Um, and most of the purples and blues are down here. And so I wanna bring this together. I've been concentrating on bringing the darks around up here to match the darks down here so it'll bring the eye around um, and right now I'm going to um, put some more blues on the little snow shadows right here in front of these background evergreens because um, I put a dark sort of brownish wash over this whole thing because it was too light um, but I want a little bit of the snow colors. I want it to be a blue shadow. And I'm going to put a few more blue lights because there's some light coming through the trees there. But I didn't want it too busy. That's why I toned it down. And I also darkened it, of course, to bring it around to match the darks because there's, there's some really serious contrast here. It's a really serious contrast. I mean, the light against the dark um, right there. So this is competitive and um, I can't have just the eye going here or just the eye going here. I want it to go around. <laughs> so I'm going to bring some of this purple up this tree and maybe in here on the shadows of these branches a little bit just to keep the blues and purples going around there's quite a lot over here, that's fine. Um, and with the addition of the blue and the lighter blue, purpley up there, that'll bring this together. But also I'm thinking about the yellows. I've got this orangey yellow and I've got this yellow and I've got this yellow. And I'm drawing a link between these, uh, not drawing a link, but you know what I mean. I'm, they're balancing each other and I want this kind of to be the center of attention to bring your eye right into the middle. So I haven't done this yet. Um, I'm going to work on this. This might be done. Um, but I've noticed up here I've concentrated more on finer brush strokes and a more finished appearance. And this is still very loose and blocky down here. So I feel like I need to bring more refined brush stroke and um, stuff down here without wrecking it because <laughs> I like it. Um, it's very hard to blend this painting because there's so much going on. Um, I like this so far and I, I love all the patterns in here. I don't want to mess with that too much. I really don't. I really like, I, I'm, I'm close to being done, I think. <laughs> I hope. So anyway, that's it's very hard to bring paintings to the final degree of satisfaction. Um, a lot of times I never make it. And then years later, I see the piece of artwork and I think, well, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> so uh, here we go. Wish me luck. but then I'm going to uh, attend an opening at Mary Williams Fine Arts. Uh, Mary has taken me on in her gallery <laughs> and she's having a sideshow of uh, florals and still lifes and she's taken on a couple of my big paintings for that. Uh, so I'm gonna make an appearance <laughs> as long as I'm in town for the dentist. 
Ugh. Rather be in town for other things. <laughs> okay, back to driving. seven years ago and the downstairs main living areas were nicely appointed with crown molding and stuff and the bathrooms are a real offense to my artistic sensibilities this bathroom is a Home Depot nightmare I mean I've tried to do drywall and I'm pretty bad at drywall but this really sucks <laughs> And I can't wait to get my hands on redoing this bathroom. I have plans. And I'm going to show on the screen right now um, how I remodeled with um, my ex-husband Frank's help uh, the bathroom in Boulder, which was worse, more of an eyesore than this bathroom. Um, I got a gorgeous... Kohler sink, which I would love to have for this bathroom, but it's out of, you know, they don't make it anymore. So I actually have, hold on to your hats, I actually have a trough urinal <laughs> that I'm going to put on the screen right now that I bought at a recycle yard. And once you get past the ick factor, it's a really nice bit of craftsmanship. I've scrubbed it, it's clean, it's gonna have new drains, and I am going to do some sort of um, industrial chic thing with it. So, if I continue on with this vlog, you might see that coming down the road in the future. Anyway, back to this bathroom. I'm going to flip the camera around and show you uh, some of these things that I am doing. I forgot to show you this ugly sink. I mean, look at this. Who installs a sink counter away from the wall? Everything falls into this hole. They didn't seal this um, stone, whatever this is, marble or something. So all the water leaks through there. And look, the wall, I mean, this is just gross. The drywall is gross. <laughs> Ugly little mirror. I mean, who makes drywall like this? Big splotches on the wall. Oh my goodness, I can't. I mean, the molding doesn't go all the way to the bathtub. It's gross. <laughs> Everybody, guess what? I finished the bathroom. Well, except for a few niggly things, but feast your eyes on. Hi, you can see me in several mirrors here. <laughs> this is um, a urinal, a trough urinal that was unused and removed from a stadium nearby, and I found it at a recycle yard. Um, I'm sharing this video with you because I want to show you uh, what you can do if you're willing to do some hard work and you're creative and pretty good with tools. I'm in my 60s and I did almost all of this by myself. 
and hardly spent any money. The most money was this urinal sink <laughs> and the plumbing to put it in because it was unusual. Uh, the plumber even kind of screwed up this valve here, which runs this uh, stream of water comes from all the holes. It's very cool. I use it all the time for washing the sink. Um, so my friend David had to uh, work hard to put a different valve in there to keep it from leaking. The floor is really cool because it's my kitchen cabinet doors and drawer fronts that I recycled and put down here. I'm going to show you all the detail on all these things in uh, different parts of the after this introductory video. Um, all these tiles were free. I bought, uh, well, I picked up these tiles from the same place I bought the uh, urinal, which was a place called Uncle Benny's in uh, Loveland. And they were moving, so they put all these tiles out on the um, parking lot for free, so I just loaded up my car. And it would have cost a ton of money to tile this whole bathroom. Now, I got these uh, frames were just family frames that I had in my shed. That one and this one. I had to cut down this to fit in this space. I had a really hard time getting the lamp up and getting the mirror to fit in there. Um, but it works great. These are magnifying mirrors, um, since can't see that well anymore. <laughs> and it's a, you know, it's like a his and her sink now, even though I don't have a his. <laughs> it's fun to use both <laughs> faucets. Um, these tiles are all different shapes and all different thicknesses and colors, of course. And if anybody tells you you can't do it, don't listen to them because it's been, um, it's very unique. Even these tiles are upside down. This is the back. I love this Italian, um, you know, business names, uh, logos. Um, if I have it on that one. And there's several of these, which is another company. Um, I sealed those and used them upside down. I scored the back so that, uh, David scored the back for me so that they would uh, adhere. Um, I kept the toilet and I kept the tub, which I didn't really want to, but I just don't want to put a bunch of stuff in the landfill. Um, I couldn't stand the fiberglass surround. So I had that taken out. Oh, I took it out. Um, David helped me with uh, the first panel and then I got the rest out. I have a brand new window. That was the other big expense. That was an $800 window to match the other windows I got in the front of the house. Only this one's white on the outside. Uh, these are Anlin windows installed by uh, Brian Cleaver's company called All Guard. Very nice window. And I got it clear and I brush my teeth longer because I can look out the window while I'm brushing my teeth and see all the birds in the backyard. It's so much fun. And you could look up when you're taking a bath, you could look up at the trees. It's just, I don't know why people put, I mean, there's a privacy issue, but my neighbors are, can't really see through the trees. And anyway, when you're taking a bath, it steams up the window. So people can't really see it anyway. Now I have a little secret to, this is just a, standard five by eight uh, bathroom, but it looks bigger. I'll go around and make you, make you dizzy. You can't really tell from what I'm doing now, but one of the secrets is to take the legs off or the cabinet out and have space under your sink that creates a feeling of space. I took the towel bars down that were here because they stick out and they shrink the space. I put one little 
thing here that I got at a thrift store um, to put your towel on when you're showering. And I have hooks behind the door. And all of that is adequate. And it, and it just gives you all this space when you're stepping out of the shower. Um, I made an alcove um, to keep the space in the shower from, I used to have a pole with, actually, with these little things, these little uh, trays, and I put them on this, um, you know, David made some nice legs and helped me figure out some, a towel bar. And so now I can just keep some of my things right handy under the sink. <laughs> under the urinal. <laughs> I'm going to call it a sink. <laughs> and uh, I have candle. I put little candle shelves here because uh, I love romantic candlelight baths and stuff. Um, okay, I'm going to um, show you how I did this um, broken up into different categories of sink, mirror, bathtub, whatever. Um, so you can scroll through any of that if you want. I just wanted to share with you that it's possible to do a bathroom with very little money and a lot of hard work. <laughs> it took me a long time. I'm not gonna, <laughs> you know, sugarcoat that. It's hard work. I did this in my bathroom in Boulder and I, I think it took three years off my life. <laughs> and this one might be a close second. Okay. I'm gonna take a nice shower tonight in my new bathroom. I'm so excited. I just have a little niggly things to do, like this little piece is missing from this frame, and I've had it in a little plastic bag for years, and I found it, and I put it somewhere for safekeeping, and now I can't figure out where, <laughs> where that safekeeping is. So anyway, little by little, I'll get that done. All right. Okay, I can't put it off any longer. And so it begins. The destruction of my upstairs bathroom. I have the task of removing the sink and cabinet because the plumber is coming tomorrow to install the very unusual sink. Um, so wish me luck. <laughs> I think we need yet another room that's uh, disaster zone, don't you think? <laughs> oh God, I hope this works.
God, we have 80 degrees today and this is the problem with Colorado it's been so ridiculously cold and I've planted some seeds on my roof garden um, some bok choy and chard and red lettuce and stuff that can handle the cold and I want to plant some stuff outside on my um, pots in the front on the driveway where it's hot even though I can never get anything because of the grasshoppers except tomatoes um, uh, so I'm just gonna try and see what happens but this is the problem I, I have a bunch of seeds here and I want to plant some things that will handle the cold but also the heat and I can't figure that out. <laughs> Okay, this is the only one good thing about removing weed fabric from your property. And don't get me started on weed fabric. I hate weed fabric. I think it's terrible. It's not natural. Mother Earth would not put weed fabric down. <laughs> she would put worms <laughs> and all those wonderful bugs to make a great bio system. Anyway, when weed fabric has been on the ground for a long time and people have put wood chips over it or just plants have grown over it and died and 
broken down. It, the nice uh, matter can't be mixed up into the soil correctly because there's fabric there. The worms can't get up and bring it down, mix it up. That's the bad thing about weed fabric. But when you're pulling up the fabric, there's this sort of black gold on top of it from all the stuff that's been breaking down, the wood chips and the fat. And I'm peeling off that nice layer of black gold, putting it in my wheelbarrow, and then I'm gonna dig down further um, to use the less good soil in a different pile over there for my pots, my garden pots. I'm making sort of like mini hugel beds for my garden pots. I'm putting sticks and leaves and stuff at the very bottom. Then I'm gonna put some kind of poor soil from underneath the weed fabric. Then I'm gonna put some of this little black gold, which is on top of the weed fabric. Then I'm gonna cut up some comfrey leaves and I'm gonna add a little, um, what's that white uh, stuff? That, uh, oh God, you know, the white stuff in a bag that helps retain moisture kick okay. <laughs> the name of it <laughs> you know what I'm talking about so that's gonna be my mix and today I'm just trying to get up this big sheet of uh, weed fabric and it's a pain in the neck I have to cut it with a razor blade and then roll it up um, heavy um, and one secret about getting up weed fabric it cuts a lot better when the, it's wet and we've had a lot of rain also the worms get stuck in the weed fabric which I hate See all this beautiful, what I call black gold. And if you look under here, it's like soil. It's wet right now, but it's very unhealthy. It's like concrete when it's hot. So there you go. Uh, it's beginning of June and everything. We've had all this rain and everything has just gone crazy, including the algae in the pond. And I'm so tired of dealing with this algae because my pond is too shallow. It's just a kiddie pool, which was supposed to be a test pond. <laughs> but now as you can see, all these plants have grown up around it. It's a whole ecosystem now. And so I don't know what to do because in order to make it deeper, get a different pond structure I have to like dismantle everything and I, I'm loath to do that when there's little snails and the garter snakes come in there once in a while and all these cattails and lilies or irises have grown up and so anyway I have this piece of um, copper pipe which uh, came out of the installation of the new um, air conditioning and um, furnace that I got. So I'm going to stick this in the pond over on the other side and cut this so that the water will dribble out and go into these little fountain dishes. Um, I'm trying to create more water. I mean, no more air to circulate, uh, more bubbles, and that helps keep the algae down and um, my old pump is just not working well. It's too old and too small. So I got a bigger pump, which is way too big for this pond. <laughs> I'm gonna try it and see what happens. This is so confusing because 
I have this, which is just like a little mini air compressor, which runs a bubbler, which is over there in the deep end, <laughs> if you can consider that a deep end. And right over there, that little black thing is a solar pump, which runs another little couple of small bubblers over in the deep end. This is the area where I've put the pond pump. This is the old pump, pond pump, which is still working, but just doesn't have much power. This is a new one, uh, which I want to use. But I'm thinking of keeping all of them and running the weaker things over in the shallow end, which has a lot of gravel, and put the... Uh, copper pipe up and over so it drips in this but the trouble is I think this compressor is supposed to be above the level of the water and I've been putting the cords through this and under this little ramp thing here through here and I had this cord but this is just like really annoying trying to figure out. <laughs> okay, so this funky ramp has a tube running under it. Comes out the other side. And I have a bucket here. I finally got all these things plugged in. This is a little compressor. And the two plugs for the two pumps, which are right here, ready to go in there. And the tricky part was getting all the cords through here. So I took this piece of um, rigid drip irrigation or PVC or whatever it is. And I taped the plugs to that and I ran them through like that to the other side. <laughs> And amazingly, it worked. <laughs> I probably got a fire hazard over here, but I hope not. <laughs> okay, now I'm gonna try to get the pumps in the water and see if they work. Oh, the solar, the little solar one in the sh uh, ground cover there doesn't need a pump. It works as a great little solar pump, but that one even stopped working, so I have to figure out what's disconnected there. Hey, it's working. Uh, this is a temporary configuration, but the big pump is here. The little pump that's still working is here. And my little bubbler is working there. I haven't got the solar one figured out yet. It might have died on me, I don't know. So, that's all for tonight. Yay, water. Out taking a walk with my lovely friend and art patron, Cindy, in Boulder today. Hi, y'all. I am, as Gina told you, one of her groupies. And I wanted to tell you how I first met Gina back in the springtime of 1999 when um, Open Studios in Boulder featured Gina as one of their tour, tour stops. And so my daughter and I went to her home and we were very deeply grieving the loss of um, a kitty who had been our family therapist for 22 years. And her name was Mikai, and, which means three colored fur in Japanese, just in case you were wondering. And so, I walked into Gina's house and there was this amazing painting on her wall of a fairly nondescript cat in a beautiful chair with cushions that Gina just, you know, how she does this like texture and stuff and light. <laughs> oh. And then there were stargazer lilies next to the cat and also carnations. And it was this stunning picture of this nondescript cat in this chair. Really, the cat was not the focal point. And, and it was a wicker chair from California. It from was a Florida, wicker chair actually. from, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I said to Gina, whom I really had never met before, I said, ooh, you know, what would you charge me if we switched out that white cat for my kitty cat, Mike, who's a tortie and would look great in that chair. And we've been looking for a way to commemorate her and I would love to do that if we can afford it. 
So Gina was, of course, game, being <laughs> Gina, and she said, well, sure. So I took Gina an album of um, photographs of our pets and was dying to see the completed project. Gina walked into my house carrying this painting, which was beyond fabulous and captured Mike in all of her incredible gentleness and spirit and loveliness. But in addition to Mike, our most amazing guinea pig named Buster, and I know you're saying guinea pig, cool. No, no, this guinea pig had so much personality. So Buster was also in the painting because Gina had seen him in the photography notebook. And so the photographs of our pets and she painted him into the picture. So I got this twofer and here's Buster at the bottom kind of smiling up at everybody. And Gina said, oh, don't worry, I can paint him out. It was like, not on my life. So this painting has graced our living room for 22 years. No, more. Well, 99, this is 23, well, anyway. And we love it. And it was the first of many of Gina's paintings that, well, I wanted to acquire them all, but we couldn't afford them all. And so to me, Gina is like a master of light. She's like a modern day Vermeer. And so, yeah, I know, I do mean that. And so that to me is like her most remarkable talent. And so, you know, uh, anyway, we have several of her paintings and some prints and I cherish them all. And every day Gina brings light and delight to our house. And I say, namaste Gina. Thank you so much. That was very beautiful.